This Brigham Young University Idaho devotional address by Elaine S. Dalton, former Young Woman General President, was delivered March 12, 2024. Elaine Dalton was born and raised in Ogden, Utah. She received her bachelor's degree in English from Brigham Young University. She married Stephen E. Dalton, and they are the parents of five sons and one daughter. After 50 years of marriage, they find themselves surrounded by 21 blonde grandchildren. <laughs> Sister Dalton served as the Young Women General President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from 2008 to 2013. She feels this service has been a grand privilege and blessing in her life. Sister Dalton served as the chair of the Board of Trustees at Utah Valley University. She is the president of the Stella Oaks Foundation. Her most important titles, however, are wife, mother, and grandmother. She enjoys being outdoors, hiking with her family, and dancing with her granddaughters. She has run 17 marathons and completed two Boston marathons. She speaks to groups of young women and women about their identity, potential, and purpose. She is the author of three books for the same audience. Sister Dalton loves life and believes in people. She has great confidence in the rising generation of noble youth. She often says, I believe that one virtuous young woman or young man can change the world. On a personal note, Sister Meredith, and I feel blessed to count Sister Dalton and her family as dear friends. Over a decade ago, when she was the general young women president, we had an assignment with her in North Carolina. It was like traveling with a rock star. But more importantly, we were touched by the way she seemed to minister to the one, even while preaching to the multitude. She has a gift for inspiring people and raising their vision. She is a builder and lifter of people. You just feel better about yourself after you spend time with her. She epitomizes what it means to be a disciple of Christ. It is a privilege to have her here with us at BYU-Idaho. Thank you for that beautiful music, which expresses just exactly who you are. Thank you, President Meredith, for the sacred trust you've given me to speak to this noble generation. It's such a privilege for me to participate today with you on this beautiful campus. It's cold, but it's beautiful. I count it a blessing that my husband of 55 years is with me to share this experience. He is my best friend, the father of our children, and my eternal companion. We met at BYU, and he still thinks he saw me first, but I spotted him on campus went to the administration building and found his schedule <laughs> and just happened to be near some of his classes occasionally. I, I, I believe you call that uh, stalking, <laughs> but I called it flirting back in the day. I still remember the day of our temple ceiling and marriage I, so vividly. Steve and I sat hand in hand in the most beautiful light room, filled room I had ever seen. Everyone who loved us was there in that room. A junior apostle sealed us that day. His name was Elder Gordon B. Hinckley. Before he married us, he gave us some advice. He said, live your life such that when you are in need of a blessing, you can approach the Father out of righteousness rather than mercy, and He will bless you. Now let me say that one more time. Live your life such that when you are in need of a blessing, you can approach the Father out of righteousness rather than mercy, and He will bless you. This counsel has guided and blessed our lives. There will be times in your life as well when you will be in desperate need of a blessing and the Lord has promised, be thou humble and the Lord thy God will lead thee by the hand and give thee answers to thy prayers. Today, I would like to speak with you about your preparation to become covenant leaders in these latter days and the power that you can access to lead as you draw close to the Lord by developing a covenant relationship with Him. 
President Russell M. Nelson has taught us that once you have made a covenant with God, our relationship with him becomes much closer than before our covenant. Now we are bound together. Because of our covenant with God, he will never tire in his efforts to help us, and we, he, we will never exhaust his merciful patience with us. Each of us has a special place in God's heart. He has high hopes for us. You can be assured that as you strive to develop and deepen your relationship with the Savior by making and keeping sacred covenants with him, he will walk with you. When President Monson called me to be the 13th General Young Woman President, he read this scripture to me and told me that I would know the reality of this promise from the Lord. I will go before your face, I will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit shall be in your hearts and mine angels round about you to bear you up. I testify that that scripture is true. One of my favorite pioneer stories illustrates this protection principle. It is the story of a girl named Agnes Caldwell, who was in the Willie Handcart Company in 1856. At the time, she was only nine years of age. As told in her own words, she related, Although only 10 tender of age, I can yet close my eyes and see everything in panoramic precision before me. The ceaseless walking, walking, ever to remain in my memory. Many times I would become so tired and childlike, I would hang on the cart only to be gently pushed away. And then I would throw myself by the side of the road and cry. And then, realizing they were all passing me by, I would jump to my feet and make an extra run to catch up. She goes on to share, just before we crossed the mountains, relief wagons reached us, and it certainly was a relief. The infirm and aged were allowed to ride, all able-bodied continuing to walk. When the wagons started out, a number of us children decided to just run alongside the wagons in hopes of being asked to ride. At least that was my great hope, she says. One by one, they all fell out until I was the last one remaining. So determined was I that I should get a ride. After what seemed like the longest run ever made, before or since, the driver called to me, say, sissy, would you like a ride? And I answered in my very best manner, yes, sir. At this, he reached over, taking my hand, clucking to his horses to make me run with legs that seemed that I could run no farther. On we went to what, what seemed to me to be miles, and just at what seemed to be the breaking point, he stopped. Taking me in a blanket, he wrapped me up and lay me in the bottom of a wagon, warm and comfortable. Here, I had time to change my mind, as I surely did, knowing full well, by doing this, he saved me from freezing when taken into the wagon. Agnes Caldwell arrived safely in Salt Lake City on November 9, 1856. She later married Chester Southworth and became the mother to 13 children. Had the driver of that wagon taken Agnes into the wagon without making her run, she would have surely succumbed to the bitter cold. And had Agnes chosen to give up and fall behind, her story may have ended much differently. However, for Agnes, this became her defining moment. And though the decision to run did not make perfect sense at the time she ran anyway, with grit, determination, faith, and hope. Now, like Agnes Caldwell, each of you is on a journey to Zion. You may not have to leave your home or give up all your earthly possessions, but the journey to Zion requires that you give up all of your sins so that you may come to know the only true and living Christ and follow in his footsteps and lead others in the paths of righteousness. In order to do this, you will need to do the spiritual work to be given the power to accomplish all that is before you. Like Agnes, you may even be asked to run to the point of exhaustion, but in doing so, 
The warmth of the Lord's love and infinite atonement will enable and empower you for the gospel work you are here on the earth to accomplish. All the sacrifice and work of all the prior generations have led to this moment. Pioneers sacrificed everything, even their lives, in order that we might see this day this, and, and see this advent on the earth. Your advent is not random. This was all part of a plan you and I embraced in the pre-mortal realm. You are uniquely positioned in a privileged place in the history of the world. In order to fulfill the unique divine mission each of you have to perform, you will need to fully understand and know who you are, your eternal identity. You will need to be guided and even magnified by the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. And you will need to be worthy to attend the temple and there be endowed with power from on high as you make and keep sacred covenants with the Lord. Your covenants will give you power because they will connect you to our Savior Jesus Christ in a covenant bond. You are here at this university in the shadow of a temple to prepare for the glorious future that awaits you. This is your moment. In the pre-mortal realms, you exhibited not just faith, but exceeding faith and good works. As Alma said, each of you were called and prepared from the foundation of the world according to the foreknowledge of God. You fought with your faith and testimony to persuade other choice spirits to accept and sustain the plan that was presented by God the Father. You knew it was right, and you had exceeding faith that the Savior would keep his premortal covenants because you knew him. President Spencer W. Kimball taught, we made vows, solemn vows in the heavens before we came to this mortal life. We have made covenants. We committed ourselves to Heavenly Father that if he would send us to the earth and give us bodies and give to us the priceless opportunities that earth life afforded, we would keep our lives clean and would marry in the holy temple, and would raise a righteous family and teach them in righteousness. This was a solemn oath, a solemn promise. There were no neutral spirits in the war in heaven, and there can be no neutral positions now. The Lord himself has said, he that is not with me is against me. You stood with him. You knew how difficult it would be and yet you were courageous and confident that you could not only accomplish your divine mission here on the earth, but also make a difference in the world. There and then, you decided that you would lead others in a superlative cause, the cause of Jesus Christ. As the winner of one of the New York marathons, Juma Ikanga was interviewed by reporters and explained his successful run in words very simply said, the will to win means nothing without the will to prepare. The power of your covenants will focus your preparation. The power of your covenants and your purity will magnify your preparation to lead. They will magnify you, and you will go forth in the strength of the Lord. The power of your covenants and your purity will magnify your preparation to lead. Here at this unique university, you are bring, being prepared to become covenant leaders. What is a co covenant leader? I believe that a covenant leader is one who does what Christ would do, says what Christ would say, and loves as Christ would love. I will never forget a lesson that I learned from President Monson while serving as a young women general president. I went to him to ask for his counsel on a matter I was so concerned about and didn't know what to do. I sat in his office and I explained my dilemma and then I said, President Monson, what shall I do? He invited me to walk with him to a corner of his office where a beautiful painting of the Savior hung on the wall. He relayed that this was his favorite painting. And as he and I stood looking at the painting, he said, Whenever I have a problem and don't know what to do, I look over here and pray. 
and then I listen. And when the Lord tells me what to do, I go and do it. President Thomas S. Monson expressed his desire to be an instrument in the Lord's hands in his biography. He shared, the sweetest experience I know in life is to feel a prompting and act upon it and later find that it was the fulfillment of someone's prayer or someone's need. And I always want the Lord to know that if he needs an errand run, Tom Monson will run that errand for him. A covenant leader is one who hears the voice of the Lord and acts. A covenant leader is one who has stepped onto the covenant path by being baptized. A covenant leader clearly understands their identity, receives, recognizes, and relies on the companionship of the Holy Ghost. A covenant leader is one who strives to remain unspotted from the world by weekly renewing their baptismal covenants to always remember him and take his name upon them and keep his commandments as they worthily partake of the sacrament. A covenant leader is obedient, willing to sacrifice, consecrated and chaste. A covenant leader leads by persuasion, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, and by love unfeigned. As each of you do these things, you will be guided by the Holy Ghost, the third member of the Godhead, who is so close, he is within whispering distance. And scriptures tell us he will show unto you all things what ye should do. To me, this is the scripture that gives a principle of assured success. The gift of the Holy Ghost will magnify you in your efforts to lead in righteousness by enabling you to obtain additional gifts of the Spirit. Worthily renewing your baptismal covenant each week, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and learning to hear His voice and obey will help you lead others with confidence. The Scripture in Doctrine and Covenants, section 121, is a leadership scripture. It says, Let thy bowels be full of charity towards all men, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God, and the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven. The Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion and thy scepter, an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth. And thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion without compulsory means, and it shall flow unto thee forever and ever. A covenant leader stands in holy places, stands with holy people, testifies of holy truths, and listens to the Holy Spirit. As you progress on the covenant path, your relationship deepens with Jesus Christ, and He will walk with you. He will lead you by the hand. Your covenants will enable you to accomplish things in the world, in the workplace, and in your families, and in the community that you may have never deemed possible until now. Making and keeping covenants adds to your ability to lead with the power of godliness. And in addition, a covenant leader knows that the source of all power is being worthy to receive priesthood ordinances and enter the Lord's holy house, because the Lord has said, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. When we make and keep sacred covenants available only to us in holy temples, we are endowed with power and angels are round about us. Don't we all need this kind of power in order to navigate successfully and happy, happily in these turbulent times? Do we even comprehend this kind of power? This is the kind of power Alma and the sons of Mosiah possess. This is the power of Paul and Abish, and Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego. And this is the kind of power that you and I can possess. Finally, a covenant leader is one who is familiar with the character of Christ. They study His words, they pray in His name, and they follow Him. They listen to His voice, and they act. And above all, they love others. 
Charity, which is the pure love of Jesus Christ, is one of the greatest powers we can possess as covenant leaders. Recently, our son Jess related his experience with covenant leadership to me. In his words, he said, one late Friday afternoon, I found myself just rushing to the airport in Houston, Texas. I'd been delayed in meetings, and I was running really late, and I was racing to catch the last plane out so I could get home to my family. I was driving a rental car, and I knew that I had to make a very quick stop at the gas station on the way in order to return the car full with gas. I didn't have time to stop, but I had to comply with the company policy to refuel the car. Jess continues, as I pulled into the gas station, I caught a sight of a glimpse of a man experiencing homelessness, sitting on the step at the entrance of the convenience store. I immediately dismissed this glimpse and the prompting of the spirit that came with it. I convinced myself that I had to make this last flight and that this was my highest priority. So I filled the tank with gas, but when I pressed the print receipt, the printer wasn't working. I couldn't believe my misfortune, so I raced inside the store, passing this man again and the prompting that came with it. I asked the clerk for a receipt and raced out of the store and caught another glimpse of this gentleman. I caught myself saying in my mind, I can't, I can't stop, and I can't engage with him at this time. I have to make this flight. So I got in my car to go, but then felt an undeniable prompting and so, to hold true to my covenant promise to myself and God, I slowly walked out of my car and sat down next to this man. I started by introducing myself and extending my hand, much to his surprise. He looked at me in astonishment. He never took his brown eyes off of mine. Jess asked if he was safe and if there was anything that he could do for him. And then he told Jess his story. He had lost his employment, his identity, his source of fatherly pride, and turned to drinking. Consequently, his wife left and told him he was not welcome in their home. He found himself here at the convenience store, sleeping under the bushes at night. He sobbed, his eyes never leaving mine. Jess asked, is there anything I can do to help you? It was then that he confided that he felt his life was no longer worth living. He continued, Last night I resolved to end my life, and then I was able to close my eyes. But while sleeping, I had a dream. I saw myself in the presence of God. He looked upon me, and he knew my heart. And as he came toward me, he held open his arms, and he embraced me, and he said, Carlos, Tomorrow I will send you a sign, and by this sign you will know that I love you, that you are my precious child, that your life is worth living, and that I will be by your side. In the dream, Carlos asked, How will I know the sign when I see it? And he replied, I will send you a man with blue eyes, and he will sit with you, and he will listen to you, and when you see him, you will know. And then this dear man looked deeply into Jess's eyes and said, you are the man with blue eyes. And they cried and hugged, and they both felt the presence of the Savior. I testify that the Lord always keeps his promises, and he provides a way whereby we can also keep ours. Covenant leaders are familiar with the leadership principles in the Book of Mormon. Thus, for you, daily reading in the Book of Mormon will prepare you to know him and to lead as he does. The Book of Mormon is actually your leadership handbook. Making a covenant with God means that you're never alone because Jesus Christ is at the center of every covenant you make. Covenants are gifts from God to each of us designed to get us safely home. Covenants are weapons against the adversary. Covenants bind us to our Savior and His Son. 
to, to God and his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why President Nelson has counseled us to make ordinances and covenants a priority and to spend more time in the temple. Your choices to keep your covenants will determine how much godly power you will be able to access in the coming days, and you will need that power. Powerful covenant leaders get on the covenant path and stay there. This is why the Lord has said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So here's a picture of a yoke. It's used to keep two oxen together so that they pull the heavy load in unison. But sometimes I like to think of a yoke in a different way. I think of this yoke as a covenant that binds us to the Savior. We walk with Him. He is by our side. We are working as one in a covenant relationship. He walks with us in this covenant relationship. He bears our burdens and our sorrows and our heartaches and our infirmities. He will carry the load if it gets too heavy. He will make up the difference. So if the yoke is our covenant relationship with the Savior, the, ship, save, the scripture actually could read, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my covenants upon you, and learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my covenant is easy, and my burden is light. Powerful covenant leaders yoke themselves to the Lord by making and keeping sacred covenants. Doing this enables you, covenant leaders, to walk with confidence and to speak with assurance because a covenant leader knows they do not walk alone. President Nelson gave us some magnificent promises when we remember and keep our covenants. I just wrote down a few in my journal that I'd like to share with you. He promised that you will be filled with God's power. Your stress will decrease. The Lord himself will go before your face and lead you by the hand. You will be comforted. You will know the right choices to make. You will be taught and receive inspiration. You will be happier. You will be a powerful witness. Your burdens will lighten. You can pray for angels to be dispatched to help you. You can pray for and expect miracles. You will be able to hear the voice of the Lord. You will walk with the Savior by your side. You will never be alone. I can testify to you that the Lord's promises are sure. As powerful covenant leaders, this is your time to prepare and to set the pace this is your time to run on the covenant path with grit, courage, commitment, and focus. And as one who has enjoyed running, I have always loved the words of the Lord to Isaiah, which say, For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. May each of you be blessed in your preparation to become His covenant leaders in these latter days. And may you always remember who you are. Prepare to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Take His yoke upon you. And like Agnes Caldwell, reach up and take the Master's hand. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. For more information about this program, please visit the BYU-Idaho website at byui.edu devotionals.